here we are, episode 10 of Meriwether's World. 10 hours of doing this. Cool. All right. Uh, I don't know how many people are there watching this week, being the day before Thanksgiving. Uh, a lot of you are probably frantically doing day before Thanksgiving type stuff. Stop doing that. Let's just chill for an hour. Like I mentioned, grab a drink of whatever you want to drink and sit back and let's learn about the foods in your yard that you can serve people if you are daring and bold. Um, tonight, you notice uh, the sponsors. We have two special sponsors. Uh, we don't have them named here because they were private individuals. Uh, that uh, one of them uh, sent me some stuff off my wish list and another just sent me cash, which is pretty cool. So if Minnie Weather would be so kind as to post their names and what they did, that was really, really cool. Uh, I'm asking Minnie Weather to do that because suddenly I can't remember. Oh, Stephanie Walker and Jeanette Belsner. Blesner. Thank you. <laughs> So thank you very much for helping keep this show on the internet. So uh, last week we ended at Dandelions and we're going to continue now in the D's. Um, as we have done in the past, what I think works best is I'll go through one or two plants and then stop for questions. If you have questions about some other plant that I have not yet talked about, I will just say, hold on, I will get to that if I'm going to get to it, or otherwise uh, kind of put that off. It's something, if it is a plant we talked about last week, uh, I will mention that. You'll have to go back and watch last week's show. So does that work? Do we have anyone in the audience yet? Several. We've got and, Mr. Rust. Oh. So, and of course, I'm being assisted this week with my beautiful daughter, Minnie Weather. I'm gonna list people. Yeah, just a few. All right, um, Miss Bunny Craddock. Ha. Ah. Um, Mr. J. Miguel Terran. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. And a lot of other people. Cool. So, so a, a lot of people don't want to clean and cook for Thanksgiving right now. Excellent. Neither do I. I'm looking up getting real. Well, I always get up really early in the morning, but I got a lot of cooking ahead of me. That's okay. I do that for a living. Well. Those of you know, I'm a chemist, which is basically a cook that makes stuff you generally can't eat. <coughs> All right, so let's, let's skip right to why you are here. Uh, like I said these last week, this week, and probably in the next few weeks, we'll be talking about all the winter weeds that are popping up right now here in Texas that can make uh, yummy additions to your food, both as salads or cooked greens or who knows what. Well, I know what. Uh, and you will after these. So without further ado, let us move on. Starting with dead nettle. This is another member of the mint family. It looks a lot like henbit, which we talked about last week. Uh, the main difference is it has a bit more purple color to it. Hence the name Lamium Purpi... I'm not going to even try and pronounce that. It's too late in the evening to speak Latin. You don't know what demons you'll bring up. Uh, but being a mint, it has the traditional square stem of a mint. It has what we call opposite alternating leaves where they're directly across from each other. Then the next set up are rotated 90 degrees and the next step up rotated 90 degrees and away you go. It has the traditional mint flower, which I love doing this. If you don't know a mint flower, it looks like this. It looks kind of like a dragon. Um, except those thumbs should be raw. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's been a long week and it's only three days. Uh, the stem is hollow. It's another sign of the mint. The flowers can be eaten raw. Uh, as far as making a tea out of them, there's really actually not a whole lot of flavor in them. Uh, they're more just pretty food. The leaves, again, the same thing. Think of them as just a, a mild green, especially useful for kind of balancing out the bitter flavor of things like dandelion, chicory, south thistle, Japanese hawkweed, uh, cat's ear, the, the traditional bitter greens. You can also cook the leaves. 
Think of them as little bits of spinach, if you will. Uh, good just to throw in anything you want to throw. You know, you would throw in spinach from stews and soups to casseroles to hot dish, which is, I guess, the same as a casserole. Uh, wherever you'd want to kind of bump up the, the green level some. As far as inedible mimics, there really aren't any. Like I said, the closest mimic would be the hen bit, which is actually edible and pretty much in the same family of mints. All right, dollar weed. This is one I like. Um, some people don't, but I like dollar weed just because it's so dang plentiful. And why do we have, there we go. We had a flashing blinking light, which distract me. Speaking of which, oh good, we have good connection speed. So dollar weed, this is a small green round weed that most people have in their yards that they end up trying to kill with all sorts of chemicals and usually maybe knock it back some, but are rarely successful at killing it. There used to be signs all over Houston that said, let us kill your dollar weed. And it was some you know, pesticide or herbicide company. And I was thinking, don't kill it, eat it, which I guess kills it. But anyway, you know what I mean identifying dollar weed uh, like i said it's going to be a round plant so imagine round with the stem coming out of the bottom i don't know if you can see that uh, the edges will be kind of bumpy the size will range from you know, very very small as they get big they can get quite large up to about the size of a 50 cent piece the ideal eating stage is when the leaves are the size of a dime up to about the size of a nickel. Beyond that, they get kind of bitter and uh, uh, like stringy. The texture becomes kind of tough, but between the dime and nickel size, they always remind me of a cucumber flavor. So we use these in salads. I guess I can move forward. Uh, mainly the leaves are eaten raw. Eaten raw. Uh, you can also use them if you're making sauerkraut or kimchi. Uh, it's always fun to do, easy to do, and this is great sauerkraut kimchi making weather with the, the cool weather coming in. As far as inedible mimics, there really isn't anything. There is a plant called Pony's Foot, which also grows creeping around the ground. It has a round kind of shape, but that shape is actually cleft. So it looks like the hoof of a pony. And we will see that mm, a week or two from now as we get into the D's, or sorry, the, the P's of the edible wild weeds growing in your yard. But the dollar weed, again, this is found pretty much all year round. As long as it has some moisture, it's pretty much happy. Uh, it does okay in sun, but it seems to do a bit better in shade but just a very, very common weed that can be used really as a cucumber substitute. Okay, any questions? Nope, not this far. No questions. Okay, back to me, the good-looking member of the family. No, just kidding. Okay, <laughs> uh, moving on. Let's go. I guess we should actually go right to the presentation. So you all understand dollar weed. Like I said, there are no mimics. The Closest thing to a mimic is still edible, so you're all good. Oops, I need to go over here. Okay, this is more of a hill country one, the fillery. Uh, not so much around Houston, but very common up in the hill country, up through Austin, and all the way out into West Texas and New Mexico. This is a very interesting plant. We have mainly two species here. One has kind of a short spade-shaped leaf. That's the one on the my left, maybe your right. And then on uh, the other one has a much more frilly lobe leaf. Let me get in a close one. A lot of times you'll see it looking like this in the, it likes disturbed areas. So like gravel roads, well-trodden paths, yards that are dry. It does not seem to like other plants around it. So it goes for places where there aren't other plants. If you pull it up, it has kind of a, a tap root associated with it. And it just has that center root. It doesn't put roots down along the stems. The leaves are actually surprisingly thick. And I think that kind of helps, uh, like in the hot, drier times, it helps just retain moisture. They're not like a succulent. They're just kind of thick. You can eat these things raw or cooked. They're really good either way. The flavor, again, is just kind of fillery flavored. It's kind of hard to describe, 
think just green spinachy again, really. The flowers, if we go back one, if you can see on the, I'm just going to look around, I guess on the right hand side, there's these long pointy things. That's actually the seed pod after the flower, but the young flowers I didn't have a good picture of right now. Uh, you can eat those raw or cook too. The seed pods are good. Really, the only thing of this plant you don't eat is the root. The rest are just good uh, raw or cooked. The seeds, uh, they produce quite a few seeds, uh, not compared to say lamb's quarter or something like that, but for the size of the plant, you saw the seed pods, those long, long spikes. Uh, that's a good source of seeds that can be toasted and then ground into flour. So you just throw them into the seed jar where you collect the seeds from a bunch of different, or edible seeds from a bunch of different plants that you eventually grind into flour. Uh, the young seed pods, treat them kind of like really long, narrow okra. Uh, I've never tried frying them, but you can throw them in other foods, gumbos and soups and stews. The uh, longer you cook them, if they're kind of tough, you know, kind of nibble a raw one first to see how tough it is. And if it's medium toughness or less, go ahead and cook it because that will soften it up some. Uh, I know medium toughness is kind of a you know, fairly subjective description, but with practice, you'll get it right. And the nice thing about them is they are easy to fish out and throw away if you guessed wrong, but they're not going to poison you. Okay, henbit. This is the one that's the mimic for the dead nettle. And if you look first, it's very similar. The main difference between henbit and the... Uh, Dead, dead nettle, besides the purple color, is the dead nettle has somewhat longer stems connecting the leaf to the, uh, the stem itself. But the same rules of edibility apply with henbit as well as the dead nettle. The flowers can be eaten raw. They make a pretty addition to salads. Like I said, flavor-wise, not a whole lot going on. But they are pretty, and if you can have pretty food, have pretty food is a theory in my life. The leaves are used raw. Think of them as, a, again, a raw spinach or, yeah, raw spinach is probably the best description of the flavor. Uh, you can cook them or you can ferment them. Same sort of things you can do with the dead nettle. So you can throw them in salads. You can cook them in soups or stews. Uh, you can put them in smoothies. You can make the sauerkraut or kimchi out of them. Now, the inedible mimic for this one is creeping buttercup. Let me go back uh, one picture here. The hen bit, the other main difference is it has a tendency to creep along the ground, whereas the dead nettle is more upright. And so if you're not careful and don't do the matching five things to make sure the plant you're eating is the plant you think it is, sometimes you can encounter creeping buttercup. Now, if you look at the leaves, the leaves look kind of similar to the henbit. So, henbit, creeping buttercup. They both kind of have that scalloped sort of leaf. Um, big difference is the growth pattern of the creeping buttercup does just creep along the... Well, nope, I'm wrong. Sorry, the creeping buttercup uh, occasionally will put up strands, especially if it's up against a wall or something similar to the henbit, but mainly it creeps along the ground. The flower of the creeping buttercup is a big indicator. It's a, a big yellow, well, a big, I mean, it's eh, about the size of a dime, really, a uh, yellow flower, whereas the henbit had the traditional mint dragon sort of flower. Don't ask me, it's just been a long week. <laughs> I have no idea why I'm the way I am. Uh, let me just finish through this. I saw an indication that there is a question. Um, well, let's let's jump to the question, because then I'll talk about how the creeping buttercup turns you into redhead after we have the question. <laughs> so, sure. question. Mr. Rust, Mr. Rust just wants to know, which tastes better, henbit or dead nettle, in your opinion, for cooking reasons? Which does better, henbit or dead nettle? I actually kind of like dead nettle slightly better. Uh, I find that the dead nettle is more of an East Texas, actually probably up by you, uh, plant where, uh, well, up in East Texas, you'll find both the dead nettle and the henbit. 
in uh, the Houston area, of Gulf Coast area, and then heading more into the hill country. It's mainly just going to be the hen bit. Uh, but the den, uh, bleh, dead nettle is just a slightly tastier, in my opinion, though part of that is because we had a lot of that up in Minnesota where I grew up, and so I think maybe there's some nostalgia or something like that. All right, so Craving Buttercup, if you were Buttercup, if you were listening carefully, you heard me mention that it turns you into a redhead. Uh, what I mean by this is there are compounds in Creeping Buttercup that if you consume them, they will make you hyper photosensitive. So if you consume Creeping Buttercup and then go out into the sun, you will immediately start to blister and develop big open wounds on any exposed flesh. This is a particular issue with cattle and livestock, sheep and horses and cattle. I'm not sure about goats. Goats are pretty much indestructible. But the Creeping Buttercup, uh, normally it tastes really bitter, but if it's dried and then used, it loses that bitter flavor. So sometimes it's still poisonous though. But what happens is a you know, someone will make hay from a field. There will be the Creeping Buttercup in it. The hay will dry, the creeping buttercup will dry, an animal will eat the hay, and then they will develop these big blisters on you know, their skin, their lips, their eyes, their, you know, wherever the sunlight uh, touches. Uh, recently in the woodlands at a, uh, a horse stable, they lost a number of horses. Uh, the horses died because of this uh, creeping buttercup that was mixed in with the, the hay. So it's something to be atten uh, pay attention to. Uh, some other things to help you identify the Creeping Buttercup is the leaves are very shiny and plasticky looking. It has a center root and it does not produce any other roots from its stems. Since that's, if you remember the Carolina geranium that we talked about uh, last week, that was another mimic for the Creeping Buttercup. But the Creeping Buttercup is one of these pretty plants that a lot of people want to eat that they should not eat. Ooh, a question. We actually have a couple. Oh. So first, does the dead nettle have the same square stem of the hen bit? Yes. So the hen bit and the dead nettle are both in the mint family. And one of the key structural components of the mint family is the square hollow stem with the alternating opposite leaves. All right. And then do the hen bit and creeping buttercup, buttercup grow together or near each other? Henbit and Creeping Buttercup will often grow very near each other. I haven't seen them entangled, but I've seen them within, you know, a foot apart. They both like uh, the cool, moist winter soils, uh, particularly the yards and boulevards, uh, areas that have been mowed some that are just normally grass. So, yeah, you, you, you will find the Henbit and the Creeping Buttercup very often very close to one another. All right, then is Creeping Buttercup as painful as Detura? As painful as Detura? Uh, I guess it depends on painful in what way. Uh, Detura will really kill you uh, if you take it wrong. Um, the Creeping Buttercup, uh, it's, it's a totally different sort of poison. And has a, you know, the, the, it basically turns you into a redheaded vampire. So... There's really not a good way of comparing the two, um, other than they would both really suck to eat. <laughs> Any others? Oh. All right, one last question. How long does the photosensitivity last? In the case of livestock, it can last weeks. Uh, the, usually the, the best thing to do if an animal has consumed that, you catch it right away, you run them into a barn or a shed and then keep them there for a long time but like I said on the um, on weeks really in humans I don't know that's actually something I should look up uh, generally humans won't be eating it because they're most people other than all your seedlings uh, don't eat random plants they find on the ground um, but yeah on uh, humans I'm assuming it's going to have a similar uh, for lack of a better term, a lifespan effect in the, on the human body. So assume it could take weeks to regain the ability to go out in the sunlight. Is that it? We're good. All right, we're good. 
So creeping buttercup, bad news plant. Very, very common though. Um, I have seen some that have been nibbled on by deer, but that's again, no indication that it's safe for humans. Okay, Japanese hawkweed. There's a lot of this growing up. This looks like little dandelions with, excuse me, little dandelion flowers on the ends of the stem and multiple dandelions. If you can see from the picture here, the flowers are, are very small. To, yeah. um, you know, like the size of a normal pencil eraser, maybe just slightly bigger. Overall, the flowers and root of this, even though it's related to the dandelion, aren't as useful or really not useful at all. It's only the leaves uh, that I use. And the leaves can be used raw in a salad, but remember they're going to be somewhat bitter. So you want to use the one of the four techniques we talked about last week, either boil it, uh, bacon grease it, dilute it with something bland, or mix it with something sour. Uh, to help remove the bitterness. Also, ideally, you want to get it before the flowers appear. Uh, once the flowers appear, the plant becomes pregnant almost immediately. And so to protect itself from being eaten, it increases the bitter content of its leaves. But this is a very, very common yard weed, especially in the winter. It seems to like to grow along fences and rock borders and kind of up against things. I'm guessing it likes a little bit of protection. It's not a native plant. It, it came from, you know, overseas. Um, but it seems to have pretty well naturalized here. But even so, it likes a little bit of protection. So look for it, you know, along the base of your house or against your fence or against a flower bed or things like that. Um, it can grow out in the middle of the yard in the full sun uh, during the cooler part of the winter. So like during January, February. Uh, right now, it's already showed up, but I'm finding it more in slightly protected areas. No Good. questions. Good. All right. Um, okay. One thing, uh, if uh, sometimes I feel like I'm not doing a good job of actually describing the plants. I'm basically saying, hey, this plant, you've probably seen it. Go look for their information, say, on the Foraging Texas website. Um, one thing I could do is go into a lot more detail on the plants, but that would stretch everything out that much longer. So let me know in the comments, do you want more details during the presentation or you just like getting the, the introduction and then going to Foraging Texas and getting all the, the extra details. All right, liar leaf sage. This is an interesting plant. This is again in the mint family though it doesn't put the stalk up until late in its life. So it's kind of hard to see that it's a mint until that square stalk with the uh, alternating opposite leaves appear. And again, of course, the dragon. Oops, dragon. The leaves are, uh, they grow in a rosette form, so they grow in a, in a circle on the ground. They usually stay flat against the ground until they start putting the stem up. And they have a purple tinge to them. Depending on, as far as I can tell, this the coloring depends a lot on the amount of sunlight they get. But usually uh, it will be, the veins will be purple. And then in shadier areas, the whole plant will turn purple. In sunnier areas, a lot of the non-vein part of the leaf will turn, uh, will stay green. But usually, well, one of the names for this plant is cancer weed. The, here's another picture of it. Uh, because the Native American medicinal thought process was like cures like, liar leaf sage, and when it shows up, it starts covering an area. So you get lots and lots and lots of plants, and they just form this mottled purple covering. So it kind of looks like a skin cancer. And the Native Americans thought, hey, it looks like skin cancer, so it must cure skin cancer. Uh, Western science has not backed that up. It does not have any anti-cancer properties that have been found so far. The leaves themselves are a little on the fuzzy side, so I prefer using this cooked just to kind of mellow out the fuzziness some. 
you can also dry it and then crumble it up to add its nutrients to the soup or stew or you know, sauce, whatever you're cooking with. Again, being a mint, it actually does not have a strong mint flavor. It's a fairly mild. It's another spinach substitute, really. Think of it as hairy purple spinach that you're best cooking. Questions? No. Nope. Cool. All right. Moving on. Mallow. And this, again, is going to be more of a hill country sort of plant. So hello to the hill country. Good you came tonight. Uh, basically starting uh, Giddings is where I, I would see it and then all through the hill country all the way out to New Mexico. Uh, there's a couple of them. There's the, the Melva Neglecta and Melva Parva Flora. Both of them are these low creeping plants. Uh, they can get pretty big though, but they have almost a scallop shaped, I don't know how to, scallop shaped leaf. Um, and they are considered to be superfoods again because they do have lots of vitamins, minerals, and protein. The leaves are the tastiest bit. Uh, again, think of them as a spinach substitute. Generally, they were cooked or, like the previous one, they would be dried and just added as a, a dried super nutrient powder to your food. When they're young and small, you can eat them raw, but like the previous plant also, there is kind of a texture issue where they're kind of rough and tough, and it's a very durable weed. So uh, I find cooking tenderizes it some. The flower you can see on the right is edible. They also produce a seed pod that's called a cheese. Uh, think of it as an okra that was flattened down and about you know, the size of a pea, really. You can eat those raw, or you can also throw those in soups or stews or you know, whatever you're cooking. And then the seeds of the mallow can also be used as a flour. Uh, just let the seeds dry or toast them and then add them to your jar of seeds and grind them up when the jar is full. So mallow, look for this in ditches and disturbed areas, uh, right around humans. It, it, it seems to gravitate to the sort of ecosystem that we create. So dirt roads, paths, full sun, it likes full sun. Um, but I find it a lot in ditches and just all over the hill country. But it almost seems like the more abuse the land gets, the more likely there is to be mallow there. Questions? No questions. No questions. And of course, our friend the Creeping Buttercup is the Mimic. So uh, the main difference, again, the Creeping Buttercup having shiny, almost plastic looking leaves, whereas the Mallow has kind of tough, kind of almost canvassy sort of leaves. Pokeweed. This is a... Uh, an interesting plant. I always consider pokeweed to be really the puffer fish of the wild edible plant world and that prepared properly, it's absolutely fantastically delicious. Prepared wrong, it will kill you. It's the same way with puffer fish sushi. You need an expert chef to prepare the, to cut the sushi just right so that you don't die. Luckily with pokeweed, it's very simple to cook. Uh, you don't have to be an expert at it. But in, actually, I've even started seeing some now, um, but I have, just a side note to go sideways here, from what I've seen of plants and nature and things like that, it looks like we're in for a bad cold winter. Things are popping up a lot earlier than normal. And uh, there's just, and then you look at the news on the sunspot, sunspot cycle and things like that, I think it's gonna be a bad winter. So normally the pokeweed shoots, which are the edible part of the plant, uh, you want to get it when it's only about the size of your hand, you know, or even my hand. I have a big hand. I don't know, it's like that big hand. Um, but generally use your hand as the ruler. If the shoot is bigger than your hand, you probably don't want to eat it. If there is red appearing in the stem, like you can see in this picture here, you don't want to eat it. There are actually two pokeweeds in this picture. 
The bigger one is too far gone to eat. The smaller ones right in front of it are perfect for eating. They're still just the size of my hand. How to eat it is you want to boil the leaves three times. So put the leaves in cold water, boil it, you know, just bring it to a boil, just boil it for three or four minutes, pour out that water, add fresh cold water, boil it three or four minutes, pour out that water, add fresh cold water, boil it three or four minutes, pour it out. After you've done that, surprisingly enough, the leaves will still have a really good texture and will not have lost a lot of their nutrients from the water, um, but you will have basically destroyed the poison in it. So after you've boiled it three times, then treat it like a collard green or a mustard green, sauteing it in some butter or some bacon grease, some garlic in there. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, last uh, winter, a husband gave me to his wife as a birthday gift. And so I spent the day with them. They had some property up in the hill country. We walked the property, uh, found some pokeweed, and cooked it up with some wild mushrooms, had a great feast. It was a good time. The, uh, the pokeweed, the poison, I'm not going to go into the chemical name because it's really big and long and a big, huge molecule. But uh, basically it causes your internal organs to liquefy and then you expel them through the various orifices of your body. The poisoning, uh, if they don't catch it in time, and usually in time means within 48 hours, uh, can quite often be fatal. So it makes you sound, why would you want to eat this? Because it's really, really good. And oftentimes it was the first um, nutritious green plant to show up after the cold winter. So it can, it's, it's a cold weather plant, uh, but even in Texas, you know, the winters are a bit cold. This was often the first really uh, nutritious green vegetable plant that people have access to after a winter of eating nothing but turnips and potatoes and meat. So people really liked it and it, it's worth liking because it's very, very tasty. If you look at the leaves, they alternate on the stem, kind of zigzag on the stem. The leaf itself is kind of a shiny plasticky feel, very thick. It grows usually in border areas. So it seems to like having lots of other plants, especially trees and bushes around it. Uh, I don't often see it out standing alone in fields. Usually it's more of a along the edge of of you know trails in the woods or right on the edge of the woods where field meets woods uh, clearings in the woods right around there so it, it doesn't want the full sun even in the winter it wants some protection uh, really 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 good plant so only the young leaves are edible the rest of the berries and the stem and all that are considered to be poisonous Ooh, a question someone asks can you please show your whole shirt by the end of the webinar do, do, do. <laughs> and now, what is the name of this person? Miss Tina Murray. Oh, okay. So let me just show the back of this shirt. I don't know if you can see it. You see it? Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I'm not one of these family members, but I had a class out at Cato Mounds, and an entire family of like grandparents and multiple of their kids and multiple of their kids, it was like, 14 people all showed up wearing these shirts because they were such fans. It kind of blew me away. Um, and of course they gave me one. So normally when I wear this shirt, I have some other shirt, you know, covering the back because I'm not a member of that family and it would just confuse people. But uh, yeah, so anyway, oh, another question. Someone says, we call it poke salad and have always eaten the larger plants. And then she says, I have never known anyone who has gotten sick. Like, what do you say to that? Okay, what I say to that is I am telling thousands of people to eat something that could be potentially dangerous and I could end up sued and lose everything if they get sick. So I err on the side of caution, um, mainly because there are lawyers in the world. So just to protect myself, I'm going to give the safest way of eating this. I've heard other people eating it at other stages, um, but that's not something I'm going to do and not something I'm going to recommend because there is the risk. So, all right. All right.
Moving on. Ah, oh, pony's foot. So this is one we were talking about that was a mimic for dollar weed. If you look at it, you can see, again, it's round with a little bit of cleft in it. Creeps along the ground. Very common all year round. Uh, frost really does nothing to, to stop it. So it's a, when it's really small, again, you know, smaller than a dime. I should have, like, imagine I'm holding up a dime. Uh, it's a, just a bland green. Think of it as like iceberg lettuce sort of thing. Not a whole lot of flavor, not a whole lot of nutrients. It seems like its main purpose in my life is either to help reduce the bitterness of the bitter greens like the dandelion, the cat's ear, the Japanese hawkweed, the chicory, the south thistle, or just as an addition to sauerkraut. Uh, these things can get fairly big. They can get eh, about the size of a nickel, but really, again, above the size of a dime, they start getting a little on the bitter uh, side. So I recommend using them smaller. Uh, dime size, if they're starting to get a hint of bitterness, if you do a sauerkraut with them, the sour from the sauerkraut will balance out the bitter of the uh, the potential bitterness of the pony's foot, the mature, mature -er 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 -er, uh, pony's foot. So you get that going for you. As far as inedible or dangerous mimics, there are none. So pony's foot, very, very common yard weed, forms big uh, mats across the grass. You can see it's, it's a fairly, sp fairly small plant. Uh, all I eat from it are the leaves. There's nothing poisonous in the stem or the runners that connect the plants together, but the stem and the runners are usually quite tough, and I just figure, eh, it's, a, again, a texture thing. So just the leaves. No questions. No questions. All right, so pony's foot. Uh, like I said, available all year round, not just the winter, but it's as common in the winter as it is in the summer. Ah, pink prim, uh, primrose. One of my favorite pictures of my two daughters was them in their Easter dresses, sitting there, bright pink dresses, uh, picking pink primrose. Uh, this is another one that I have started seeing way earlier than normal, which is, again, making me think it's going to be a cold, cold winter. So edible parts on this. The flowers you can eat raw. Uh, that being said... Um, a small percentage of the population, like maybe 5% or less, uh, will suffer a little bit of stomach distress after eating some of the pink primrose flowers. There is no good way of telling in advance, so I just recommend if you're not sure, you know, eat one or two flowers, see how you feel, and if you feel okay, you know, increase it. Also, you know, don't surprise it on people unless it's really easy to remove from the salad or on top of the cake or wherever you're using this really pretty edible pink flower. The leaves, especially if you can get them before the flowers, are another spinach substitute. So that's always my fallback. You know, if you can use spinach, how can I use this wild edible green as spinach? So the, the raw leaves, they have a toughness to them that I don't like. So it's, again, better to, uh, to cook them, uh, steam them, boil them, chop them up, put them in a sauce that gets simmered for a while. Uh, but you can do the sauerkraut or kimchi thing with them. But ideally, you want to get the leaves before the flowers appear. I think it's another case of the sacrificial brother-sister where the plants are generally not bitter until the flower appears. Because once the flower appears, it gets pollinated. The plant is then pregnant. And so it says, you ain't touching me. And it suddenly becomes bitter. So this is one where it's good. You know, a lot of people won't recognize it at first. So they'll see the flowers. And they just keep an eye on the leaves. Look at the leaves and then go back. Uh, the next year, you know, really right about now. Normally I would say in January, but it's it's already popping up. So just look for the leaves. And if we go back one, whoops, that's not back, that's forward. Uh, the leaves are kind of pointy. They actually grow on strands, or I won't call it a vine, but a long creeping stalk that kind of creeps along the ground. Okay, no questions? No questions. Okay. Like I said, it always makes me nervous when there are no questions, like no one's paying attention. 
All right, plantain. This is a really fascinating plant. Uh, a very common weed. This is not native to North America. It came with the white man from Europe. In fact, the Native Americans called this the white man's footprint because it seemed wherever the white men went, this plant showed up behind them like footprints. The leaves have what's called a palmate structure rather than a pinnate vein structure. So if you were to look closely at the leaves, you would see the veins form long parallel strands coming up from the stem whereas a pinnate has one central vein and then the other veins come off it like a Christmas tree. I have no idea what I'm trying to do here. But yeah, so if you think pinnate vein structure, center vein, and then the other veins come off it like a Christmas tree. Palmate, you just have vertical uh, veins running parallel to each other. So the plantain has the palmate vein structure. The leaves are usually hairy. There's several different varieties that grow down here uh, across Texas, um, but they'll be a bit on the hairy side. And as usual, I don't really care for the leaves raw that much. They're, they're pretty bland. Um, I should say I don't care for the, the leaves eating them because I would prefer to make medicine out of them which will be another topic for another night. So you're, you're going to have to tune in uh, to learn about the medicinal plants at another time. But the leaves you can eat raw. What I do like are the young seed heads. If, so if you look in this picture, these seed heads, the individual dots there are the seeds already starting to mature. When you get them, when the seed head is still really compact and the seeds are really tightly close to each other and it's uh, pretty much green in color, uh, the, the seed head almost looks like a green little ear of corn. It pretty much tastes like a little green ear of corn at that stage too. And so that's my favorite time to get them. I'll just eat those raw or I'll put them in uh, wherever I would put little baby ears of corn. So like in a vegetable soup or a stir fry or things like that. The mature seeds, if roasted, take on a kind of a coffee flavor to them. So not just bitter, but you know, kind of hints of coffee co coffeeness. Uh, no caffeine, though. The main claim to fame for the seeds is a number of home brewers have started using those seeds as a flavoring agent to make porter beers. So the porter beers, those are the dark, rich, almost coffee-like beers. Uh, the book Brewing Local or Local Brewing, the one that I was a technical advisor on, talks about that. Well, um, as far as inedible mimics, the cudweed uh, is that. And do I have a picture? Ah, oh, there we go. So the cudweed uh, at first looks very similar because it grows in a circular fashion, low against the ground. The leaves have kind of a club shape to them, but the leaves, if you look closely, they have uh, the pinnate leaf structure. So it'll have one center vein, and then the other veins will come off that center vein. So you can kind of see it in the picture there. Um, the other clue that you're dealing with the cudweed rather than a plantain is the underside of the leaf. On the cudweeds, if you flip the leaf over, the underside is going to be gray, almost white in color. Uh, whereas the plantain, it's going to be green on top and the same green underneath. Uh, there are some cudweeds that are even white on top and white underneath, and I would think that'd be even less of a plantain mimic. The cudweeds, while not edible, I have some really cool medicinal effects, which again will be another show. Any questions? Ooh, a question. Someone asks, plantain flavored yopon. Plantain flavored yopon. There are so many better things to flavor yopon holly with. I wouldn't bother uh, with the plantain. Actually, I would I would use the cudweed uh, before the plantain. The cudweed uh, has it's been consumed as a tea and smoked for its medicinal uses. And it has kind of a, an aromatic, I won't say menthol flavor, but uh, a, kind of a different, 
gunweed flavor. Ah, oh, it's so hard when no one else knows the, the flavor is. But think of it um, like the smoke from the cudweed kind of reminds me of a menthol cigarette. All right, whoops, I need to go over here. Oop, wrong way. What am I doing here? Okay, all right. Next one, sheep sorrel. Uh, this is a nice uh, Rumex. Uh, this is in the same family as the curled dock, yellow dock that we saw last week. So it has a nice tangy, uh, lemony sort of flavor. Uh, similar to the wood sorrel. So wood sorrel, curled dock, and the sheep sorrel all have this tangy, lemony flavor. I honestly feel the sheep sorrel, uh, especially the young leaves, have really the best flavor of those three tangy, lemony plants, with the wood sorrel being uh, a very, very close second. The leaves of the sheep sorrel are kind of funky looking. They always remind me of a boar spear, where you have the center spike, and then you have two kind of blades coming off the side. Uh, it grows in clusters like a small bush. And yeah, the uh, very young, like the, what you would find it looking like right now, the tips are rounded rather than the pointy spear. So as the leaf matures, it starts kind of round and then gets pointy. And the side spears get bigger and bigger. And I can't really do that. Um, so raw, really, really good when it's a baby, when it's going to seed, really any time you find that plant, the leaves are nice and tasty. Uh, when the leaves are really starting to break down and look ragged and starting to dry, at that point, they're too late to eat. But anywhere from young baby like this to long pointy shaft like that, they're really, really good. The... Uh, you can use them raw. You can throw them in soup. I uh, mentioned the... Uh, oh, actually, I didn't. Um, excuse me. The tangy, lemony things like the sheep sorrel uh, goes really good in a cream of mushroom sort of soup or a cream of potato, cream of celery, cream of chicken uh, because it adds a nice tangy zing to the cream. So that's one of my favorite ways of... Well, my favorite way is just eating it raw. But then the second would be mixing it with like a can of cream of mushroom soup. The seeds, um, you can see here at the top there, they have a reddish color, a different red, more of a, I want to say a red red, as opposed to the rust red of the curled dock, the same family member. Um, they're almost more of a pink red. A lot of times you'll see a whole field of this stuff and the field will have kind of a, a red pink color to it. Sometimes it's called a red sorrel for that reason. Um, but the seeds, oops, I'll just go back one more. They're at the ends of the spikes there. You can strip them off like you would the curled dock, um, but they are smaller and less numerous than the curled dock. And so generally I don't do anything with them. A uh, big part of that is not because of any flavor or hard work. It's just, I want lots of sheep sorrel around. So I want the seeds to spread in nature. If I can find some that I know are definitely uh, ripe and mature and ready to fall, I will click those and then put them other places to try and get more of this plant because it is so delicious. Ooh, a question. All right. So... They ask, can it be assumed that any plant shaped like a plantain with parallel veins is plantain? Hmm. Oops, let me go. Oops, back one. So any... Oops. Well, yeah. Hmm. Okay, let's just answer the question then. <sighs> Mostly. The uh, young black-eyed Susans sometimes look somewhat plantainish, um, but they are much bigger, much hairier. Well, they grow much bigger, much hairier. And what they have is they have kind of a cross between a parallel vein structure and the uh, pinnate uh, vein structure where they'll have multiple thick veins but then off those, you'll get veins that go off and run up parallel to that. So they like branch and go up 
kind of go down. So if it is a true parallel where there are no side veins branching off anywhere, I would feel much safer saying, yes, that's a plantain. If you see anything coming off those veins, even if they're just, again, running parallel to the veins, then I would be cautious. Then most likely it is a black-eyed Susan. Another question. Is there any edible plant that has a tarragon flavor? Tarragon flavor. Uh, it would be easier to answer that question if I could immediately pull up in my head what tarragon flavor is. <laughs> I'm thinking that's kind of the black licorice anise sort of flavor, uh, which would lend to the pot marigolds, which is more of a domesticated landscaping plant. Uh, but nothing that jumps in my head right now. Sorry. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. Sow thistle. This is another common dandelion mimic. At least at first, a lot of times people think it's just some giant spiny dandelion. These things can get quite big. Uh, they can get, you know, almost four feet tall. The leaves, it's kind of hard to see on the left hand picture, but the leaves have that kind of spiky with spiky. Uh, dandelion leaf shape, especially when they're young, they will form that rosette like a dandelion. If you look at the stalk growing up, the stalk can be very thick, like, you know, pinky thickness. And unlike a dandelion, a true dandelion, the south thistle, it will have leaves coming off the stalk. And if you can see in this picture here, a lot of times the leaf will be kind of wrapped around the stalk. Uh, so it's very distinctive once you start looking closely at the features and comparing them to different plants. So the sow thistle, a uh, number of things you can do with this, is even though the leaves look prickly, they're really not. They're almost like a prickly mimic or a thistle mimic. The, the leaves are, especially when they're young and small before the stalk has put up, uh, the leaves are good as a cooked green um, raw, they're still pretty bitter. So these I would do the, like the bacon grease, I'll do that with them. But otherwise I will do other sort of, you know, the boiling, which generally isn't a, a great thing to do. But with the south thistle, it's, you know, the, the bitterness from the raw is just too much. Uh, you can dilute it some, but generally cooking it seems to help the leaves a tremendous amount. Now the flower buds, if you see those, there's a cluster in the center of the picture. And if you were looking closely at them in the wild, you would see the tops of the flower beds have kind of an any belly button. So the, 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 the sepals kind of close in on themselves. So they form this any belly button. That's when you want to collect the buds. And you take those buds when they're like that, still in, and drop them in your pickle juice. And just let them soak in the pickle juice for a good six to eight weeks. And they turn into something almost like a uh, pickled caper. Very, very tasty. The bitterness and the sour works together perfectly. They're a great, just as is relish on bratwurst or wherever you would use relish, but a really wonderful pickled, uh, bitter sort of thing going on. Totally, totally worth it. Now, it's important, though, to get the flower buds where they're still closed, where they have never opened. So uh, while the mature, while the, the flower bud is growing, it will be closed with that any belly button. But eventually, one day, it will open up into a flower. And that night, it will close into a point. And the next morning, it will open up into a flower. And then at sunset or well, late in the day, it will close into the point. And then the third day... It will open into a flower again. Later in the day, it'll close up, stay closed for about three days. And when it opens again, it'll be the, the dandelion puffball sort of thing. Now, if you take the flowers when they're you know pointy like this, after they've opened once and gone to a point, they're significantly more bitter and they're kind of fuzzy and stringy and they're not very good pickled. So you want to get them when they've never opened, where they're still closed in on themselves. They've never opened up into a bloom. As far as inedible mimics, if again, if you match all the different features, the leaf pattern, the vein pattern, the, the flower buds, all these sort of things, there is nothing else that really looks like a south thistle. Spiderwort. 
this, if you remember the day flower, this is a very similar plant looking like that. Whereas day flower crept along the ground, the spiderwort has a thicker, stronger stem and it goes in an upright manner. The uh, flowers, they have three parts, three blue flowers, and they come from a pod. It's a little hard to see in this, but the end of the plant will have a whole bunch of flower pods kind of hanging down. And then each day, one or two of these will open up and then the three plong, three, three petaled flower, <laughs> the three petaled flowers will come out. So the spiderwort, they have three petals. The day flower we talked about last week has two petals. That's the main difference. Then the spiderwort stalk is very, very thick. The flowers are edible. Just eat them raw. Uh, if you cook with them, they're they're pretty delicate and they just disappear. I mean, like the day flowers, the the spiderwort flowers don't even last a whole day. If it's cool and and not too sunny but not cold, uh, they'll open in the morning and 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 you might find them in the afternoon yet. But a lot of times by one or two o'clock, the spiderwort flowers are already are are already gone. Well, you can eat the flowers, you can eat the unopened flower buds, and the very top leaf, the, the first leaf closest to the flowers, is usually tender enough to eat. Uh, farther down the stem, they get uh, kind of thick and tough, and I find they're just not really, I'm not really into them. So I just want the very tips of the plants. The stem, another name for this is cow slobber. If you cut the stem in half, and just hold it open it will ooze a slime a mucilaginous aloe vera like slime and that's all i'm going to say about that other than if you chop it up really finely the stem chop up the stem really finely that slime can be used as a thickening agent but i find the stems themselves are are kind of tough so you really have to chop it up fine uh, like put it in a blender or something like that but then you got all this mucilage you know, whipped up too. You know, whoa. almost <laughs> almost make a meringue sort of thing. Holy, oh, wow, it's 8.56. So this is actually a good place to stop. As, I don't know if you can hear my voice. It's, it's already going. It's been a long week, uh, but I keep saying that. So do we have any questions at this point? Um, someone asked, there's a dichondria that's silver and very pretty and can be bought. And they ask, would this grow well in a pot? It was related to the primrose. Yes, uh, the silver dichondria, yes. That I've seen it sold in landscaping or you know, plants, nurseries, things like that. Uh, it's edible. My experience with a lot of wild uh, edible plants... Well, go grab the lasagna. <laughs> Sorry, ignore the beeper. That's supper. Uh, a lot of the things like stone crop and some of the other uh, plants that were wild but then were domesticated and made prettier uh, get a little bitter in flavor. Bitter in flavor. I'm not sure why, but it just seems to be what's happened. All right, what else do we have? That's it. That's it. Except for questions about the shirt. Oh. Everyone's asking, why don't we have it? What's well, my shirt? <laughs> Um, it sounds like there's interest in the shirt. Okay. Um, so people want me to, oh, oh, uh, so, okay. Add to the list, sell shirts. I'm always willing to sell stuff. Uh, speaking of which my Amazon store. So Amazon, uh, amazon.com slash shop slash foraging Texas. I've been getting ready, the, uh, getting it ready for the Black Friday, Christmas sales, Cyber Monday, whatever thing like that. So I've added a few more sections to it. Uh, one of the sections is things to help introduce your kids to nature and foraging. There's a number of books like My Side of the Mountain and Hatchet and a few others that are great for reading to young kids. Uh, I will say uh, I've read all these to my kids and by the time I got to Swiss Family Robinson, I discovered that they were terrified of going into the woods because they were afraid they would end up lost there. So you kind of have to balance it out, separate it with other books. Um, and then there's also a section uh, devoting to just uh, wilderness survival gear. And I'm also setting up a section on urban survival gear. Uh, things that I always have with me, I always carry with me uh, just to make sure I can get home no matter where I'm at. 
So at that point, we are at the end of the show. So let us just say, hey, get in here, get in here. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy <laughs> and, Thanksgiving. Uh, I guess we'll see you next week. And same plant time, same plant channel. Otherwise, have a fantastic Thanksgiving. Enjoy it. I, if you're alive, you have something to be thankful for, I hope. All right. Good night, everyone. And...